All right, so we're going to be looking at um, properties of exponential functions. We're actually going to have six of them. All right, we're going to start off by talking about the domain. So the domain, which we know are the x values, are all real numbers. When we are just talking about um, any kind of a function that is exponential, most of the time um, x or t stands for time and specifically time in years and you might be thinking well that can't be negative but when we talk about negative time in math we're talking about time ago so um, domain can be both positive and negative it can also be zero at the start when there no time has passed you could put a zero in for x or for t so the domain is all real for the range, we're going to actually say two things about it. So for the range, whenever you're trying to figure out domain and range, I know this is something a lot of people struggle with, you have to ask yourself, can it be positive? Can it be negative? Can it be zero? So you want to ask yourself those questions. Another thing you can do is you can try to envision the graph and think about um, the graph in terms of the y-axis. So let's look at our calculator. Okay, so here um, was one of the exponential equations that we had looked at, 12 times 0.7 to the x. And when we graphed it, let's look at that graph. And I want you to know that this right here, um, it looks like it's on zero, but it's actually not. It can never actually cross and go, it can never actually hit zero. It's not that it can't cross it, it can't ever actually touch it. And you might be wondering, why? Why is that the case? Um, let's look at another example. So first of all, we're going to look at this graph, and it looks like it's touching the x-axis, but it's not. And then why don't we just change this a little bit, and let's see if we can make this a 1.7. See if that makes a difference. Okay, let's try graphing that. Once again, notice it gets really close, and I know it looks like it's touching it, but it's actually not. What I want you to think about is if I had a piece of paper, so let's not. All right, so let's say that I've got this piece of paper. I'm actually going to make it smaller so that you can see it better. We start off with this sheet of paper. And I'm going to multiply this sheet of paper, which is one sheet of paper, times a half, which is 0.5, which means this sheet of paper is going to get smaller. So here's my sheet of paper, and I'm going to cut it in half. Okay? Then I'm going to take that sheet of paper, and I'm going to cut it in half. So this is an exponential function. It's representing it because I'm taking this and I'm multiplying it by a half. And I keep doing the same thing, and I keep doing the same thing, and I keep going, and I keep going, and no matter what, I am technically going to keep having a sheet of paper. Now this teeny tiny little piece of paper, as I continue to cut it with my scissors, is going to get really, 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 really tiny, but technically, there's still always going to still be a sheet of paper there. It's never going to actually reach zero, and it's definitely never going to get across the x-axis and go into the negatives. So all that said, what that tells me is that the range has to be my positive reals. Notice it can't equal zero. So it's going to have to be positive. It cannot be zero. And then um, the other thing we can say about our range is that it's going to have to be a multiple of b, whatever b is. Because think, we're taking the starting amount and we're multiplying it by b x times. So we keep multiplying by b. Remember that example on the calculator where we kept multiplying by 0.7? or we kept multiplying by 1.7, and so it has to be a multiple of b. The other thing um, that we're going to say about this is the fact that the graph must contain the point 
zero a. That's that y intercept right there. So this zero a is the y intercept. The other thing is that it can never cross the x axis. That's because with, with my piece of paper example, no matter what, I'm never going to reach zero, and I'm definitely never going to cross and go into the negatives. And the last property of exponential functions is one of the first things we said when we were doing our definition of exponential functions, is that if the b value is greater than 1, it's a growth model. And if the B value is between 0 and 1, it's a decay model. So what I want is I want you guys to get used to what every type of exponential model, how it could be written. On our first page of notes, um, I told you what the starting amount was. I told you what the growth factor was. And I told you what the time was. And so you just use the formula. Well, what do we do when that's not the information that I give you? So we're going to look on this page at some examples that are still exponential models, but the information is presented in a different way. For instance, um, this first one, it says in a study of the change in an insect population, there were about 224 insects four weeks after the study began and about 572 insects two weeks after that. All right, so it says to find an exponential model relating the population to the number of weeks after the study began. So we're going to do an exponential model. Remember in the other sections that we did on the other days, we did linear regression models. Now we're doing an exponential model and we're relating population um, to the number of weeks. So what I realize is that the information they've given me is they've really given me two ordered pairs. They've told me that at four weeks, I have 224 insects. So I can think of that as an ordered pair and 572 insects two weeks after that. So at six weeks, because notice, Every, the population is in re reference to the number of weeks after the study began. So two weeks after the four would be six weeks. There's 572 insects. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to my calculator. And I'm going to use the calculator the same way I used it in linear regression models. I'm going to go to Stat and Edit, and I'm going to enter the ordered pairs. In the L1, I'm going to put my independent variable, which is my four weeks and my six weeks. And then my L2 is my dependent variable, which is my 224 insects, and then my 572 insects. And then the change comes when I go to calculate the model. I'm going to go to Stat, and I'm going to go to Calc, but this time I don't want the linear regression model. I want the exponential regression model. You can um, arrow down, or what you can do is you can simply hit zero on your calculator, which actually stands for the 10th thing in the menu, exponential regression. And I'm gonna hit enter, and I need to go down to calculate, and I'm going to find my exponential regression model, All right? And I will write that now in um, my answer sheet. All right, so when I write that out, I am going to still round to three decimal places. I know that might sound crazy. We're talking about insects here. But the thing is, is that since we're always estimating, my model can um, have decimal places. And then when I give my final answer as to how many insects, that's the point at which I can do my rounding. For instance, question B says, estimate the initial number of insects. Well, that's going to be my A value, which is right here. So when I look at 34.352, that means that there were approximately 34 insects. 
Then it asks me to predict, that means I'm going to use my exponential model, the number of insects five weeks after the study began. So I'm going to put a five in for x and use my calculator and I'll get that answer. All right, so I put my equation in my calculator, that's what I got. And because I'm predicting about insects, I'm going to go ahead and round the nearest insect. So I said that I had approximately 358 insects. All right, the next thing we're going to look at, look at is half-life. And what a half-life is um, measuring is, let's say you start off with a substance that has 20 grams, and that substance is slowly decaying. How long does it take for that substance that's 20 grams to now be at 10 grams? And then how long does it take that 10 grams to get to 5 grams? And that 5 grams to get to 2.5 grams? And how long does that take? That's the idea of a half-life. The formula that we're going to use, we're actually going to look at two different formulas. One is um, A is our starting amount. 0.5 is always the growth factor for half-life because you're losing a half and that means you still have a half to the x power where x is the number of half-lives. Now a lot of times we don't have enough information to use this formula so we need another formula and our other formula that we need is a is the starting amount, 0.5 is still the growth factor and then that number of half-lives is calculated by t divided by n. t is our total time, so a lot of times we know the total time that we're looking at, and then we're dividing it by time in a half-life. And when you take t divided by n, or total time divided by time in a half-life, you get the number of half-lives. So let's look at an example here. The half-life of one, acid, one isotope of a synthetic element, fermium, is 20 hours. How many hours are there in three half-life periods? So the half-life is 20 hours. So if I have three half-life periods, so that's kind of like this x up here, three half-life periods, how many total hours is that? Well, I have 3 times 20, which is 60 hours. How much of a 50 gram sample of fermium will be left after three half-life periods? Okay, so I've got 50 grams as my starting amount. I have 0.5 for a half-life, and I know how many half-life periods I have, so I can just simply say to the third. If I didn't know that, and I knew that it was 60 hours, I could say 50 times 0.5 to the 60 hours divided by 20 hours in a half-life period. Do you see how either way we get 50 times 0.5 to the third? So we're going to put that into our calculator. And when I put that in my calculator, I got 6.25. All right, let's go to part D. It says use the equation in C to find out how much of a 50 gram sample will be left after 150 hours. So I don't know how many half-life periods, which means I'm going to use this formula here. I started off with a 50 gram sample. It's a half-life, so the growth factor is 0.5. The total time is 150 divided by how many hours in a half-life? 20 hours. I will put that into my calculator and get my answer. All right, so I got 0.276 grams, and I put that down on my paper. So you're going to read and do this example on your own. I do not give you the original amount. It's simply a sub zero. We know that it's a half-life, so it's 0.5 for the growth factor. The total time is 2,000 years. Time in a half-life is 5,700. This is the only part I can put in the calculator, and when I do that, I'm left with 0.78, which means that after 2,000 years, I'm taking the original amount times 0.78, so about 78% of the carbon-14 remains.